Let your spirit meet us here, O Lord, body, soul, and mind. Yes, so many of us are in need of mending. We bear our troubles, the struggles of kin and friend, our nation to this hour. Receive our thanksgiving and gratitude, even when it feels lost in unrest. Hear our praise lifting its voice out of places so loud with hate, with worry, caught up in uncertainty. We find hope, holy friend, that you are hearing us even before we speak our needs from this sanctuary and from altars raised by family and solitary pilgrims all across this community and beyond. Such assurance binds us together, leaves us leaning towards one another into the balm of your loving embrace. Healing God, we lift our hearts to you in one voice as we pray. We, we offer our sometimes broken lives to you, O God, longing for your touch. As we experience your presence and steadfast love, may we aspire to be a house of healing to our city, which longs for hope, abundant life, and true community during this pandemic. May we have the perseverance to rely on you through this season, and especially after, when the search for meaning and wholeness will continue, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and he gives to all of them their names. Great is the Lord and abundant in power. His healing is beyond measure. Sometimes I feel The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, and makes grass grow. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and hope in his steadfast love. This morning's reading comes from Mark. Listen closely for God's word to us today. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with John and James. And now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered at the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions, they hunted for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came to do. 
And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Well, we've been at this for quite a long time, gathering online, gathering in these separate ways. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Whether you've been with us every week or this is the first time that you've checked in or if your habits have become sporadic, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your support, and thank you for being faithful wherever you are and however you've found to be uh, in this bewildering and bizarre and fearsome time. And wherever you are and whoever you are, I just want to say God bless you and I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus has just left everyone in the church slack-jawed. His fame is beginning to spread throughout Galilee, and no sooner have they left the worship service than Jesus and his new disciples, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, head over to Simon Andrew's house for a big Sunday lunch. 
Now there was just one of those houses everyone knew, Simon and Andrew's house. Everybody knew the address. It was the one with the fun birthday parties when they were kids. It was a gathering place for teenagers after high school let out. And on weekends, you'd find pickup basketball and sleepovers. And when it snowed, it was where everybody knew they could go for a good cup of rich, creamy, hot chocolate. It was just that house in the neighborhood. And when they get there, the house is quiet. And something doesn't feel right. Andrew and Simon go upstairs and they find their mother in her bed with a fever. And they'd never seen her like this. And they're beginning to get a bad feeling. And they came back downstairs and they had this worried look in their eyes when they... They, their eyes met Jesus' eyes. Jesus knew something. Something was bothering them deeply. And so they told him, Mom's sick. Mom's sick. And we got a bad feeling about this. So Jesus goes back up to the bedroom. And he goes with them and he finds her lying there. And we can just imagine Jesus, who just an hour ago had calmed someone from yelling at him in the middle of a sermon. Gentle Jesus now, cupping his hand over the woman's head and realizing the seriousness of the situation. He looks across the bed at Simon and Andrew as if to say, don't be afraid, friends. Then Jesus takes his hand from her forehead and then he takes her hand and his and he lifts her up. The word here is the same for raised up. It's the same word we get in Mark about 19 other times. It's the same word we hear from the man dressed in white right outside the tomb when the women are gathered there, frightened and amazed. And he tells them, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Well, he's not here. He's been raised up. And we get these little hints of resurrection all the way through Mark and other Gospels, foretastes and foreshadowings of resurrection. And one of the categories of these foretastes is Jesus' miracles of healing. Jesus takes Simon and Andrew's mother by the hand. He raises her up. Her fever leaves her in an instant. And within an hour, she's back to her normal busy self and making her special spaghetti sauce for the big Sunday lunch. And as soon as lunch is over, the disciples are back out on the streets and describing what has just happened. And by sundown, the word is out. And the whole city is gathered around the door. And Jesus has his hands full, curing fevers and other illnesses and casting out demons. Can we imagine the glorious commotion and the excitement that's surrounding Uh, this house and all the hope of that evening can you imagine seeing all of these people bringing out their loved ones or themselves and waiting in the courtyard waiting their turn watching the sick and the ill people entering one way and coming back out the same door standing taller their color returned to their faces furrowed brows now at ease springs in their step One long face after another entering through the door and one radiant countenance after another coming out. And the excitement and the hope are building in you too. As as you wait for your own family or your own friend or yourself to see if this miracle healer can take you by the hand too and raise you up. Now, I've typically read this story as just one of the Jesus' many healing miracles. But if we zoom out just a little bit from this scene, not, up, not all the way up into the clouds, but just 30 feet or so, we'll just move up to the third story, look down on this two-story house to get a more comprehensive view. I believe we might just be able to see something especially intriguing. If we look at this event on this special evening from this more comprehensive uh, perspective, we may not only see Jesus healing people. We may also see a house and a front yard 
full of people gathered around a healing Jesus. And in my way of thinking, that's also what we call church. There's a a specific way that Baptists have thought about church from the beginning. Baptists have said to the question, what is church? Church is wherever two or three are gathered. They, They interpret Matthew 18, 20 in this very particular way. Before church had been wherever the priest had been or wherever the the sacraments had been administered, but Baptist said, no, there's something more to it than that. It's wherever Jesus is and people are gathered around Jesus, that's the church. It's gathered. It's the gathered church. And that's one of the gifts that Baptists have, have offered to the whole church. And that's what Baptists have been saying church is for over 400 years. And here we have perhaps hundreds of people gathered around a healing Jesus. This is one of the earliest pictures we have of what church is and what church ought to be. A community of hopeful people gathered around Jesus, longing to see him, longing to be touched by him, even if they've never heard of him until that very afternoon. But if you'll follow me just a little bit deeper into the story, I want to show you something else. Mark calls Simon and Andrew's house an oikon. That's the Greek. That's the common Greek word for house. But it's also one of the root words for our English word econ, economy. So I want to invite you, as you imagine yourself floating over the scene, and imagining it as one of the very earliest glimpses of church, to see it also as a little glimpse of a healing economy. This is not only a picture of what church ought to be, but a little eruption of God's kingdom economy, a a manifestation of God's dream for abundant life, a real-time sighting of our future and our destiny in God, not only for baptized believers, but for everyone in the city. In telling this story, Mark offers us a blueprint for a church to be a thriving, healing economy. A people gathered in and around a house and a place where Jesus shares his power indiscriminately with everyone in the city. Now, if you follow me just a little bit deeper into the story, I want to show you what I believe, is that this is our story too. Across the past year, as you've engaged in our online worship services and other media, you will have noticed that one of the common occurrences is either a video footage that begins at our door and zooms out over the sanctuary and then across to the city, or instances of our members and friends standing and reading scripture and praying and testifying and doing missions around downtown Asheville and uh, and the region. All of this has been intentional. It is all meant to help us strengthen our imagination about who we are and why we exist and who we as a church exist to serve. So I know it's just been such a strange and difficult chapter of our lives. It doesn't matter how old you are, even if you're a little kid. This is strange. This is hard. This has been a most supreme challenge Not only for our congregation, but for congregations, communities of faith around the world. That's what we do. We congregate. We gather. That's part of what substantiates our ability to say what we are. We are a gathering, but we have not been able to gather the way we know how to do it best. It's been difficult, to say the very least. But I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to be afraid of this fever. I don't want you to be afraid of what's going to happen to us. I don't want you to be afraid of 
being diminished on, a, on the other side of this because we have a mission and we have a passion and we have strengths among our own very particular congregation to be just this kind of healing house that if you zoom out on it, you see people gathered around the front door of this place across our time and history and story longing to see Jesus, to meet Jesus, to be touched by him, to be changed by him. And I don't see that dynamic changing, pandemic or no. It's been our strength to be a healing house, a gathering place. So let's take that strength and, and zoom out on it and, and continue to dream and imagine what it might look like for us in an economy that has tanked and splintered. To be the kind of place that as vaccinations rev back up and the economy revs back up and people are out and about again looking and longing for a place to gather and a Jesus to come close to and a God to find them and give them strength and healing that they might find that here and a little house, a little economy of hope and healing and resurrection. Join me in that hope, will you? Don't be afraid. Join me in that hope that as we begin to move out of this difficult time, that we will stand on our strengths to be able to say to our whole city and to be a glimpse for the nation and the world even, of what a house of healing, a house of hope, a house of resurrection can look like. Now if you just follow me one little step deeper into the story, a reminder if you will. How did all these people end up around the house? Simon, Andrew, James, and John, after they've eaten all that spaghetti, which isn't in the text, but if you read into it, it's definitely there. It's definitely spaghetti here somewhere. And they're feeling like, really, they, under normal circumstances, they would want to take a nap. They, they leave the house, and they go out to all their neighbors and their friends, and they say, you've got to come to my house. And people say, why? Jesus is there. And he's healing. He healed my mother, and he can heal you. So at a time when they, were, they could have stayed home and been comfortable and rested, they went out, and they told the story, and they invited people back to their house so that they could be close to Jesus too. And so that's our invitation. Doesn't matter the circumstances. Doesn't matter... The temperature of the fever doesn't matter what situation we're in right now. Whoever we are, wherever we are, we can tell this story. We can move out into the neighborhoods and share with our friends and our neighbors and even strangers and say, look, there's, there's a place there's a place I know that you can find healing and hope and foretaste of resurrection. Will you come? So let's get to it. Go on. Go. After the benediction, get out of the house. Extend the invitation to resurrection.
Lord, hear our prayer. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for an amazing world, the congregation, staff, and ministers that make up this First Baptist Church of Asheville. 
let us remember that our Savior Christ taught us simplicity is good and blessed. May these gifts of time, talent, and money through the simplicity of true love bless the minds, the bodies, and souls of your precious children to whom these gifts are given. We reverently pray the actions of First Baptist Church of Asheville will grace your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Beloved, we've been giving such beautiful work to do together, and it's that time of year where we invite you to invite others to pick leaders for our church to help us do this work. You can go online, and I encourage you to, actually I should say I encourage you to stay online. Before you X out of your web browser, would you go to the home page in the News and Info tab, and look up the Leadership Selection tab, and Prayerfully consider those whose names you might enter into the form and submit to the Leadership Selection Committee. This job every year is very carefully done and wisely done, and that's one of the reasons that we have so much to be excited about and proud of. But it doesn't happen unless you offer us names of those people among us who remind you of Jesus, those faithful stewards who help us do this beautiful work together. So I invite you, submit a name uh, in these coming days and weeks, uh, and Marsha Leip will be leading uh, this committee. I'm very grateful to her and all those who will be taking up this sacred task. Now receive this benediction. God be in your head and in your understanding. God be in your eyes and in your looking. God be in your mouth and in your speaking. God be in your heart and in your thinking. And God be at your end and at your departing, now and forever. Amen.